Welcome to the Echo Essentials Podcast. I'm Scott Clark. And I'm Dave Dale. We're recording this on Wednesday, September 25th. The day after the town hall. There was a town hall Mm -hmm. where um, council set up, I think it was in the library. Yep. And they wanted to hear from the public. Mm Mm-hmm. What is Jennifer McCharles and Stu Campaign saying about that meeting? I only picked up the Bay-to-A story so far. I haven't read Jennifer's yet. But uh, Stu was saying that there was a couple um, presenters that kind of wish they could have asked some questions, had a QA and a at the end, because one of the presenters didn't show up and there's some time. Mm -hmm. But they were told, uh, Mayor Cherico told them that the the procedural bylaw limits them. And they, they can't do that unless they change the bylaw, which they have done numerous times. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't he in the last meeting suspend, uh, suspend the uh, procedural bylaws? I think, I think we're going to set a record for uh, procedural bylaw suspensions this year. I'm going to yeah. have to double check the data. <laughs> but you can't do that if you want to hear from the, from the public. Uh, yeah, something like that. Now, here's the thing I'll say about that is like, I get it. Like, now, granted, they're not volunteers; they're elected officials that do receive uh, remuneration for for their time, um, and um, you. And when you get into a town hall setting, it can go for a long period of time if you if you don't put parameters and guardrails around it. Mm-hmm. So I, I totally get that, right? But there was only sixteen people, I think, at it, right? It wasn't very many. No. And I think in Jennifer McCharles' article, she interviewed uh, Bonnie Zufeld. Well, from partners, yeah. and uh, Bonnie seemed kind of pissed at the end. She said it was a waste of time. Mm-hmm. Um, it was really interesting, and you know, town uh, town halls, in my opinion, it's a way to allow people to empty their bucket. Mm-hmm. So, in in my opinion, not that you wanted to be there all night, allow whoever's in the room to empty their bucket, yep. and listen to get them. it all out, get it all out, mm-hmm. empty your bucket. Okay, we heard from you. Now let's let's go back. Um, you don't want the story to be. We didn't get to say. Enough. We didn't get to say anything. Are you in a town hall meeting? We couldn't an- get and questions I get answered. It, but th- those yeah. are the rules, and it was laid out in advance, and it oh, all yeah. makes sense. Oh, they followed right? the rules. They followed the rules. Yeah. And uh, but it's like, gosh, then the story becomes the rules. The rules. Yeah. It's like ah, it's like you know, it's it's not an easy job. No. It's not an easy job. And even you wouldn't do that, that job. I had, I elected not to uh, put my head in the ring. So yes, for a reason. And that was one of them. That was one of them. Sticky rules that would have drove me nuts. Sticky rules. Yeah. There's... Right? That I would have broke somehow. <laughs> <laughs> well, it would have changed your entire path, right? If you got into that. Yeah. yeah. Anything you did moving forward when it comes to reporting or your opinions on it would all be skewed. Yes. Yes, it would be. So one of the topics was uh, about award system. Mm-hmm. And it's I, coming I've, up again. I've always felt that, you know what, like we're not a giant city. And it's like, it, it, to me, it doesn't make sense, award system. As I spend more time, and I've, I've had one, two, three, I've had three homes in, uh, in North Bay. So I've lived in West Ferris, lived in Pinewood, and now I'm back in West Ferris again. So it is interesting. I think, you know, West Ferris doesn't get as much love as it should be getting. It seems like there's other parts of the city gets more love. So now I'm sort of leaning a different way. Maybe we do need representatives in West Ferris or uh, from West Ferris. What do you think about a ward system? Well, we do have two from West Ferris. Uh, Tanya Vraybosch and uh, Chris Main both live in West Ferris. Mm-hmm. Um, I say that right before my number one problem with the ward system is what happens if you end up with somebody that's not being listened to at council and isn't very effective in your ward and that's your go-to person. It's kind of like uh, um, a bummer, right? Uh, If you don't get a very functional, effective uh, political person to, to move things forward. If you end up with somebody below the number five spot Mm -hmm. who isn't a chair of a committee, who isn't a vice chair of a committee and and, and seven, eight, nines. um, But wouldn't that be part of not only the potential elected official, 
but the elect that that person who's running for council to say, look, I need to, I need your vote. To, I need to represent you. I need so mobilizing those voters in that area because it's a numbers game. Well, that's how to get you into get the elected. Top five. Yeah, um, yeah. And I I think because West Ferris is one of those areas that I've seen in when it comes to. Um, you know, politicians, be it all levels of government, that they knock on doors. And one of the primary places they knock on doors is West Ferris because people vote in West Ferris. That and the doors are closer together. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably that too. I deliver mags all over the city. I know I know the uh, which neighborhoods are So you can touch easy. more people. You can get to more people. You can uh, get you, to more people. You actually can. Yeah, yeah. and there's 40% of uh, North Bay lives in West Ferris. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Ward system, I think uh, I, I would like to see sort of a hybrid model mm -hmm. because if you do end up with a dud for your ward for some reason, um, at least you have a chance to get uh, somebody that uh, is uh, representing at large, mm -hmm. right? And uh, how that works, I'm not sure. But um, one of the letters to Bay Today actually indicated along these same lines um, that Councillors should have to reside in the city, uh, within the uh, within the uh, city boundaries, uh, to be able to re represent well, which is along those same sort of lines. Yeah, I don't know if I agree with that, right? Like if you're because it, you actually have to be a taxpayer, right? So anyone who may be living outside of the city is still a taxpayer within North Bay. Mm -hmm. So you have skin in the game. Yep. No matter how you look at it, I get why. Yeah, you want them living in. Yeah, but if if someone's living, let's say I'm living in West Ferris, and someone's living in Airport Hill on the escarpment in their beautiful home, it's like it's a very different experience. I have driving down Lakeshore Drive, and someone in front of me is always making a left hand turn. It drives me insane. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It does. <laughs> drives everybody insane. Oh, I can't believe you're making a left hand. You block traffic for miles. It's yeah. Um, it's a very different experience between the two, right? Yeah. And very different concerns and a number of different things. So I think it's, I think it's fine that, uh, that as long as you're a taxpayer and you have skin in the game, then you should have a voice. Well, I think there's only one counselor on council right now that actually resides outside, even though they run a business here and they have uh, property here and that's Mark King, I mm -hmm. think. Um, it, I think it used to be more of an issue when Dave Mendocino was on council and Al McDonald was. It seemed like everybody was out in... Uh, They're Corbeil, right? Is it Corbeil? Yeah. Yeah, they were Corbeil. Yeah. Corbeil and they lived beside Ferris. each other, I think, uh, Dave and Al. Yeah, so yeah. it was an easy target. Right? right. And then, of course, then people started talking about how people who work for city services, like firefighters, police officers, they should live in the city too. It gets a, Why? It, that's the next step when you're talking about this conversation. Oh. Well, they're benefiting from our tax dollars. They should have to pay the same property taxes as us. Well, some of them do, actually, because uh. now they own a couple properties because they, they work for the fire department. <laughs> <laughs> they work for the... Uh, I, don't, I don't agree with that. No, I don't think so. Yeah, I don't agree with that. Can you imagine if in, in Toronto, if you, you had to live in Toronto? It's, like, it, it's, in, it's impossible. <laughs> it would be you know, bedroom communities and as cities grow and people move and no, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't agree with that. It's, so, like, it's like the old argument too. Uh, the, and that it's when uh, people say we have to pay counselors, elected officials more to attract better talent. Mm -hmm. I, I would say this when it comes to that, if you try and pay uh, people to be on council, don't be in the middle. You either pay nothing or you pay a lot. If you're in the middle, you're not going to get the caliber you were hoping for. Well, it's interesting that a lot of that argument comes from people who are elected and are getting paid, and they ran with that knowing what they're going to get paid, and they didn't have to come up against any better talent than that. So mm -hmm. it's hard. It's a hard argument to make from the council seat. It is. Um, Mac Bain moved recently. Where did he move to? I just, because I'd always drive by his house. I saw him went in for sale. He's not there anymore. I believe he's in the O&R uh, building. He actually lives in, oh, yeah, really? Yeah, there's all the retirees in, in, in uh, the uh, O&R uh, retirement building. Yeah. Oh, yeah, okay. A nice little spot there, I believe. Yeah. yeah. Dave, let's have a word from our sponsor. And that is 
the LaFlambeau's team at Realty Executives Local Group and Inc. Brokerage. It's a lot of technical terms. Do you know uh, Matt and Natasha were the ones that uh, that looked after my home when I purchased? I hadn't purchased a home in many, many years. And they stepped up and uh, and helped me and walked me through the process. And they were so good. Local team. They know the uh, area very well. And the other thing they did that I was really impressed with was they really did an assessment of all the homes around me, like what I've sold recently and, and and a complete assessment so that when you came into when you were selling your home, I was selling my home in the, in the Pinewood area and moving to West Ferris, um, that they really gave me confidence about what was going to happen next. So it's not just Matt and Natasha, though. You know, uh, Phil Sagan, Adam LaGrose, they're all part of the buying and selling process and part of their team. They've been here for over 17 years serving the community, and Matt's dad was even before that and served in the military, and uh, I miss Matt's dad very much. So their goal is about knowledge, support, guidance, and preparing people for their home for sale. And uh, they bring it, help you bring it to market with selling strategies, and they help get it sold. And that's what they did for me, and I was super, super happy. You know, as a home buyer, uh, and uh, you're looking for, uh, you know, someone who's going to look out for your best interests, these are the people that I went to. And I hope you do as well. Go to laframboiseteam.ca. They will help you. Ask for Maddie or uh, Natasha, Phil, or Adam, and they'll look after you. There you go. That's one of our sponsors. Thank you, La Framboise team. Founded in 1968, Voyager Aviation is a proud member of our community, providing worldwide aviation services from our headquarters right here in North Bay. If you're looking for a challenge, change, or want to expand your current career in aviation, Voyager is hiring for a wide range of technical and non-technical roles, including pilots, aircraft maintenance personnel, corporate administration, machinists, supply chain professionals, and more. Be part of a workforce that is over 400 strong, supporting humanitarian, government, defense, and civil aviation operations around the world. For a career in aviation and beyond, learn more about open positions and career paths at voyav.com. Our condolences uh, to the ONR and the ONR family for the, the tragic loss that uh, that took place the other week. Um, and uh, I just feel, as a community, I feel horrible for what took place. And uh, my son works there. And so people are affected by that. And I just, on behalf of, you know, the Echo Network, I just want to say, you know, our deepest condolences for the incredible tragedy that took place. And... I hope over time there's there's some healing and and uh, and uh, our thoughts are with the with the family. Well, it's always tragic uh, when someone loses their life, uh, and to do it at work, it affects everybody. Ripples right through. Workplace safety is such a big issue. Mm-hmm. I know a few people in the industry that teach that, and uh, this will end up becoming. Uh, when the, after they do an investigation of how it exactly happened and, and what could be done different, it'll become a teaching tool. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's unfortunate. What a cost, though, eh? What a cost. What a cost. So. Um, in, today's, uh, in today's episode, we're, uh, Dermot uh, is joining us. Dermot and Wilson. Dermot yes. Wilson, uh, artist extraordinaire, um, and uh, he's traveled the world. Vagabond, yes. A vagabond. <laughs> He's traveled the world to uh, uh, to help bring attention and uh, and acknowledge what we are doing to our forests, but but not against forestry. More about hey, let's let's take a look at what we're doing, just so everyone's aware. Yeah, like instead of ignoring it or always fighting it or just embrace the fact that. Our society is gobbling up parts of the earth, and we should take care of somehow, be sensitive to what we're doing. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, Dermot is like, he's basically the Johnny Appleseed of art. He likes to go and get things growing here and get mm-hmm. things growing there, and he brings people together, and he just keeps doing his thing. So he's an interesting character for sure. Let's get into the, uh, get into the interview.
Today we're going to get all artsy. We're going to get artsy <laughs> with Dermot Wilson. Welcome mm. to the studio. Thank you, David Dale. And thank you, Scott Clark. Nice. Very, very much. <laughs> thank you for coming me. in. You're just back from uh, Poland and you were doing some uh, Broken Forest, forest stuff and uh, there's some other stuff going on with the art group that you're involved with. So uh, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you're going to fill us in. How'd it go in Poland? It went amazing in Poland, guys. It was just um, um, so great to interact with so many people. Like we had great audiences and um, we did uh, three art exhibitions in a in a, a botanical garden that had this special festival event. And, you know, we were sort of featured there. So we had Cesar did a performance there and uh, Don Kretchen from Nipissing First Nation uh, had a solo exhibition of his artwork, which kind of blew them away, right? They had never seen anything like this. And there's a kind of... Um, um, I guess um, a love of the mystique of the indigenous Canadian, right, uh, there in Europe. And um, so being presented with an, uh, an actual artist and somebody who's um, uh, making contemporary woodland uh, artwork from our region here in North Bay, it, um, I think it was really exciting for them. Yeah. And, uh, well, Don's a pretty cool cat. I remember meeting him at the uh, Broken Forest Conference we had a couple of years ago here. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I'm, yeah. I'm not clear what the Broken Forest Conference is. Uh, can yeah, you yeah. Can dial back just sort of <laughs> yeah. before we get into the details? What is this group about and how did it get you to Poland? And yeah, well, long story short, um, but, um, let me say that Broken Forest is a group of artists that are raising awareness of the sacred nature of our forests worldwide, of the concerns, the environmental concerns around forests, and um, raising awareness of how industry is changing to cope with those changes. Um, There's something now called regenerative forestry, which people like Dr. Susan Susan Samard is is working on. So it came out of that, and it started in Poland. Uh, Just this group came together. We were in the forest in Poland, very um, old, old forests there that have been decimated, but also are extremely important to their culture there. Um, so, yeah, so since we founded it in Poland, it's basically just a Facebook group, you know, where we tell people we're performing here or we've got an exhibition here and we're talking about, uh, you know, um, the art that we've made in the forest or who we've met and what we've learned in the forests. Mm -hmm. And so that, um basically led us, you know, across the country. And um, we were able to invite a whole bunch of artists from other forests in other countries here in 2022. And we had a conference. And that was the one that Dave helped us out with and was the kind of um, main documentarist, I guess, or something for the for that conference. Um and that was held at the Canadian Ecology Center. So we were able to partner with uh, Bill Steer, who I think has been on this program a few he times. He has. He has yeah. his own program. Back He's an Bill. artist, right? He yeah. is an artist. I don't know if I've seen his art before. You've heard it probably. He does haiku poetry. Oh. Wonderful haiku poetry. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. I don't know if I've heard it before. Have you heard it yeah. before? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Where did you hear haiku po- poem from Bill Steer? Uh, at the Ecology Center. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Probably n- not far from the Ecology yeah. Center, out in the woods somewhere or something like that. Interesting cat. But shout out to Bill. I've yeah. Absolutely shout out. Um, How has uh, art evolved around forests? Because so much of our art, I would say in Canada, not all, but a lot of it, is based on nature, uh, is, is uh, uh, the backdrop of so many beautiful 
you know, artistic expressions. You know, look at the group of seven. It's yeah. it's all based in art. How is it? How has it changed or has it changed over time? I think it has changed. It has expanded. And I think, okay, Broken Forest is also associated to a a kind of more traditional group called the Ontario Society of Artists. And they were there at the conference and they – we've just completed a a project with them up in Tomogamy. Their art is, is quite traditional in form, Scott. So it's like um, it's examining that type of – using that type of medium, I guess, landscape painting, but seeing different things. So we went out to a clear cut in Tomogamy and they painted that. Kind of um, – that, that's one sort of area of expansion. I, I would can't say. see myself hanging a clear cut painting on my wall, the, but I haven't seen one. It, w- would I? Yeah, yeah. I, uh, well, maybe if it had a nice hopeful butterfly in the corner. Yeah. Or something. <laughs> it was like seeing a clear cut is like ah. Uh, oh, it, it is, but you know, oh my go- goodness, the clear cut that we just went to in Jordan River, absolute beauty, absolute beauty. Yes, there's a lot of destruction. Yeah. There was even piles of burned twigs, but there there was also an intense beauty to that experience. And for me, it's like we need to, again, have sensitivity and kind of expand our notion of of what we can live with, perhaps, you know? Um, the, the, the thing is that the clear cut is a reality. It's out there. It's getting bigger and bigger, and um, it is definitely time to embrace that, to to not to ignore it. You know how that's been an issue in 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 our our struggle to protect the environment. The issue has been that we don't we kind of tend to ignore. We'll just like you know ignore that that issue or oh you know, there's that slag heap over there let's not you know, let's not go over there or there's that garbage dump over there let's not go over there the the idea is basically not that it's okay but this is part of our responsibility as humans right mm-hmm. this is part of who we are so let's get in there and see it you can't ignore it whenever i fly into bc Mm-hmm. You can't ignore it. You see, you see it everywhere. Mm-hmm. But mm-hmm. it's it's interesting that I don't seem to hear it as much in the news. Okay, yeah. But so you, what I think you just said is it continues, or and it grows, and it's yeah, it does continue. That we heard when we did our clear cut reanimated project, where we constructed uh, seven different installations in the clear cut using elements of the clear cut, right? Using the wooden sticks. We heard that the game has upped a bit due to the price of wood and due to the scarcity of especially old growth wood, uh, which is different. It's different from the the soft woods that we purchase over at Rona, Mm -hmm. right? But what's happening out west is they're not leaving. Remember the buffers? Remember you'd be driving down the highway and on both sides, it was, wow, what a great forest we're driving through. Mm-hmm. But then if you stop anywhere along that, get out, go, go along an animal path for 100 meters or so, beyond Wide that open. buffer. Wide open. Yeah, bald. Yeah. So, so that has changed. They're not doing that anymore. They're leaving it. They're clear cutting right to the road. Interesting. Yeah. So there's a bit of a... Uh, there's alarm bells that go off there, and I am not one of the people that believes we should alarm people. I'm more about let's just face it. Let's just go in there and take a look. Mm-hmm. Every time we go out and take a look at a clear cut, we are we're inspecting it in a way. We're oh. What's that machine over there? Or who's that guy? What are they doing? You know, mm. that's, um, I believe that that's helping. It, it is interesting when I've seen some of the machinery, like, uh, you know, you go back, 
let's say 50 something years ago, mm-hmm. it was a very different process. Even when it came to clear cutting, you look at the machinery now, it's, it's, they're like transformers, right? Like yeah, yeah. they can grab a tree, cut it, mm-hmm. r- rip all the limbs off it, put it on the truck in minutes. Yeah. As opposed to, you know, the traditional lumberjack that goes in and cuts it down. And, you know, sure, it's it's probably made it a whole lot safer to, in doing that. But the speed in which it can be done yeah. is incredible. And the, and the amount of destruction it can, re, re, you know, it can achieve is up there. But we yeah. need wood, right? Yep. You're not yeah. against cutting of, of uh, trees down because we need wood. Uh, I do. Yeah, of course we need wood. I'm, you know... I got to build an extension on my studio. There you go. Slash woodshed, right? <laughs> uh, so that um, that uh, yeah, that is going to be built of wood. Yeah, it, but I think calling it destruction is still okay. Mm-hmm. I know uh, one of my songs is called "The Aesthetics of Chaos," and to me, uh, my artwork. Is looking at that. Um, a chaos is not as negative, perhaps, as people might think. Um, within the art world, anyway, we see chaos as sort of the fuel for our our um, individual uh, sort of unique expression. Mm-hmm. We couldn't get that unique expression if everything was completely ordered. You know, if every you know. Walk into every forest and it's all one tree here, next, next, next. Um, so the aesthetics of chaos starts out with the, the lines, uh, there are tree farms across era where the red fox cease to thrive. And that's, that's kind of happening all over the world. The, the, the tree farming is creating issues for animals, insects, Birds. Shit. You brought your phone into a podcast. I know. You got to buy the next round. I, I actually but, thought. Yeah. I actually Isn't there a beer game? It. There's totally a beer game there. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Dermot, you owe us a beer. Everybody gets a beer. Yeah. I want that kept in. <laughs> Keep that okay. in. It was like we were talking about the trees oh, and the forest. Go to and then quickly. The said you one guy to... who has the technology, you wouldn't think it starts ringing in the middle of a podcast. It's Dermot. Yeah, well, you said you wanted me to meet at Gateway for a beer. Well, there you go. <laughs> uh, that's great. Okay, I lost a beer there. Um, sorry. <laughs> let, let me bring it back to uh, yeah, news. Yeah. I was reading in the Narwhal magazine that does the environmental investigation stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, great mag. They, um, they had an article about uh, the number of times forest uh, companies uh, color outside the lines, basically, uh, mistakenly go outside the boundary of their resource-managed allotment. And uh, the story was about um, how the um, British Columbia uh, ministry is supposed to be keeping track of stuff. Couldn't readily say how many times or how much area and how much forest was eaten up by mistakes mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. and uh, going outside the thing. So uh, yeah. it's, it's certainly a matter of... Uh, Active resource management, those mm-hmm. were the issues. And some of the mm-hmm. issues that they have to deal with is over-harvesting in places yeah. and mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. maybe uh, the return of the forest to just a, a monoculture is a mistake, right? Yeah, a monoculture is a, a big mistake. Yeah. Big mistake. When they're planting that's... just one type of tree because that's yeah. the best tree to plant that they, yeah. they can sell. Um, so it yeah. be kind of sterilizes the forest yeah, mm-hmm. to a point. Yeah, yeah. and I, that regenerative forestry, if you look that up, if you Google that, you'll see that it isn't about monocultures. Um, it isn't about tree farming. It's about trying to regenerate a forest, so recreate it in a way. Um, there's also that big idea that we talked about at the conference of uh, indigenous forestry management, mm-hmm. which is a big um, Mary Laronde it has been into that since the 90s, mm. right? And um, um, that's a really important. The, the clear cut that we visited was actually harvested by the First Nations community, right? By the Pachidat community. And so that was one of the reasons why we were privileged to be with the elder, Bill Jones, 
uh, from the Padshidat community, and he, you know, was just talking about this is the reality. Let's be it. Let's be with it. Let's not hide behind screens or, you know, uh, um, hide within our, our homes or wherever. But um, let's take off the blinders and become sensitive to these areas. You have a few other things going on with the uh, NRCC. Um, what's up? What's the newest? What's the NRCC? Nipissing Region Curatorial Collective. Okay. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it's, it's, um, so that group, just to explain the group, is basically something that uh, Laurie uh, uh, Johnson and Nickerson, Laurie Nickerson and myself and Dave was there early on, Rich Fortan as well. Um, we came together um, to just see if we could help artists. There's a heck of a, a digital firewall for many indigenous artists what do you between mean by that? themselves yeah. and the granting bodies, mm. right? Between themselves and the exhibition assistance grants and things like that. Um, so, uh, and also even between themselves and, and a buying audience, right? Art has become um, quite a social media activity. Now, hmm. for all artists, right? Like yeah, not just yeah. indigenous. It's, not a, just it's indigenous. a group for yeah artists trying to deal with the realities of their economics, right? Yeah. It, it, mm. So when you say that, that means what? That uh, that mm. arts consumed more uh, in social media, or Our art is consumed a great deal in social media, a great deal, and I don't know the half of it because I'm the age I am. Mm. Um, it, this is something that's happening within uh, new younger generations of artists. They're supporting themselves through social media, mm. which is awesome and great. Um, the The thing is that um, it's not it's not just that digital world. We also it's it's called a regional collective because. The art that's being made in this region of northeastern Ontario is great and needs to get out there. And that's why the first time we went to Poland, uh, it was myself and Don Gretchen, and we kind of marketed his work that way. So the collective also tries to get the work out there. So we create art shows that we show in Toronto and other parts of the the province. Um, we help artists to go to other countries to show their work, uh, and that's hard. <laughs> Believe mm -hmm. me, that is tough to do. Mm -hmm. um, but it ends up, um, you know, uh, professionalizing artists. It now has become, for a few artists, a profession. Mm -hmm. It's something they'll do their whole life. North Bay Echo is proud to partner with Twigs Coffee Roasters, a part of the community since 1995. Twigs offers a wide selection of quality beans, fresh roasted in-house every day. Find your favorite specialty drinks at our espresso bar, rejuvenate with freshly squeezed juice, or treat yourself to mouth-watering selections from our gourmet deli. And don't forget our irresistible fresh baked goods, including uncompromising gluten-free options. Twigs has five locations to serve you from North Bay to Sturgeon Falls to Sudbury. Order line for pickup at twigs.ca. And coming soon, you'll be able to order fresh roasted coffee beans direct to your doorstep from our distribution center in North Bay. How has art in North Bay changed or accessing art, uh, participating in it? Um, for me personally, I, I find it's, it's just out of my grasp before I, and maybe because certain things that I was so used to and thought were wonderful, like art experience at Canada college. Yeah. Yeah. Like that I was such that a, one. Well, I guess yeah. it would be Canada or Nipissing together. Right. Mm -hmm. But it was, that was such a beautiful thing they did every year. Mm -hmm. And people came from all over, but eventually ended. I'm not sure why. 
Yeah. Um, yeah. But there was a lot more, I felt there was more accessibility. Am I just imagining it or? Um, the art experience, that's, that's Keith Campbell, right? And we uh, have to like bow down. Yeah. He's, he's that was my old, brother. That was he's, Keith, eh? Yeah, yeah. He, he um, created that, founded it with others. Uh, but he's kind of the, uh, the main artist for me that created art experience. Right. But uh, how it's changed, one thing is we have galleries like Gallery 222 and the Nova Gallery. To me, they're really important, not because they, you know, sort of are a part of the, the artistic community, more because they're a part of the public community. They, these shows, and there's a great one up right now. At 176? Yeah, Is that the Nova Gallery? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's the Nova Gallery? Yeah, when, yeah. that's what okay. we call the Nova yeah. Gallery. And you, yeah. you know it well yeah, from like Marley's sure. show. And yeah. I didn't know it was called Nova Gallery, by the way. Yeah, so yeah. Until, until now. <laughs> it was 176. I would go yeah, in. Yeah, it's yeah, all yeah. that beautiful art in yeah. 176. Yeah, yeah. Lakeshore Drive. Um, yeah, and um, so that is not as much for the sort of um, art um, art public as it is for the public public. So people see it, they just it, love what it creates for them, going to work or coming to see the massage therapist or coming to see whoever mm -hmm. is in that building. And so it's integrated. So that's a big change, I think. It used to be that art was more in a sort of a isolated space, which is also great. I'm not denigrating that. Mm -hmm. It's a very... That's the seed that creates our culture is the Kennedy Gallery, is the Whitewater Gallery, mm -hmm. these places, is the Media Lab, for that matter, the Near North Mo Mobile Media Lab. Those are seeds that create our culture. But I think that the, these, these uh, galleries out in the public are also important and, and have expanded, you know. There's something going on up north that we got funding for? Um. Yeah, that's a really cool project. I know you guys are going to love this one. It's called Queer Up North. Queer Up North. Yes, and it's directed towards artists that identify as LGBTQ+. Um, and what it's doing is removing a stigma, a stigma that exists perhaps uh, that it says that um, queer artists are not a part of the, you know, do not like nature. They're more, they're more urban, right? Um, we've discovered, because we just had the first uh, two-week residence uh, at our, our residency, which is called the White Bear Air, White Bear Artists International Residency Program. It's in Tomogamy. It's in the town of Tomogamy. I want to come back and talk about that, Scott, because we're creating this thing in the town of Tomogamy. They are loving it. That community has embraced it like, you know, a long lost soul or something. Oh, they've come. Uh, and the artists love it. They're creating amazing work. And they're also supporting uh, indigenous and local artists that identify in the same way, that see the world in the same way. So I'm going to ask a question. <laughs> it, I, I like, so having, okay, uh, that it's wonderful that you're having that, that mm -hmm. I, but I would never, I've never even thought of that. What someone's sexuality is when it comes to art, I'd be like going to a theater performance, say, well, we're going to have a theater performance, especially for gay people, like LGBTQ. Mm, yeah, yeah. I, I, I don't even think about it. I'm there for the art. Yeah. Why? why mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm yeah, scratching why my head a little you, bit. Why? why you sort like, of, yeah, kind I'm, of. I, um, I don't know. That's a pretty tough question. Um, for me. Do gay artists feel that they're on the outside if you if you're doing... Mm. natural landscapes I, I don't I, I, I never think, even thought of that I think it's that that in the past in contemporary art there there was sort of areas of interest of certain artists and uh, 
for example, landscape painting, you know, and there would be ev everyone of every different type and, and gender uh, um, would be participating in that. Yeah. Um, I think now art is, is important in different ways to different people. Um, environmentally, uh, this Queer Up North project is seeing the forest differently, giving a different perspective to people, and it echoes with people who may be discri discriminated against for their gender, you know? Um, so it how, appeals to them. How, yeah. how, how, how is it different? How is the art different? Yeah. I think it's... Um, I think it's about the connection between the human being and the forest much more directly. It places the human in the forest um, and it's kind of anti-traditional in a way. It isn't landscape painting, right? So for me that means, yay, more attention to the landscape. Um, more viewpoints, more – yeah, basically attention, um, which is the goal, I think, of the white bear is to raise awareness of the fifth largest old growth stand of trees in the world hmm. is at the white bear. Uh, where, is, uh, where is it being held up in Tomogamy? This is why I want to come back because it is held f a four-minute walk from the train station. I thought you might have held it at the train station. It's so we beautiful. Did. Oh, we you did. did. We it's did. beautiful. Yeah, the yeah. Train that's station. the art. That's where we show the work. That's where the studio is, and um, also um, where we are certain that um, Toronto and global artists are going to be flying to Toronto, hopping on the train, and coming up to Tomogamy. Cool. Shouldering their backpacks and making some art. Well, you've been busy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, not really. How long you've been <laughs> in town to for? You guys. <laughs> how long you've been in town for? Uh, like, how long are week. you going to stay in town? Oh, this is actually. We had another project that was going to Korea. We were going to go to Korea, make some art, and bring Korean artists here. Mm -hmm. That was going to happen like now. It was supposed to be happening now, and. Um, We've decided at NRCC to postpone that until the spring. So I basically, I'm like free as a bird until I go back to Brazil in February. Oh, and there's ice follies too. I love ice follies. Ice follies okay. is coming. Oh, I love yeah, yeah. What, what you guys do for ice follies. It's, it's and it's super popular, right? Yeah, you get it's lots super of traffic. Popular. I think it's fantastic. It's uh, Sharon Switzer, the executive director of the Near North Mobile Media Lab. Is somebody you guys should talk to. Yeah. She is pushing that thing along. It's like a huge success. I love it. I think. Yeah. When's I it taking it. place this uh, coming year? It's, I think it's February 1st to 15th, but don't quote me, please. Um, it, yeah. Last year, because we had an early melt, right? Like it was, I think it was near the end. It was like, <laughs> it's getting melty out there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Talk to people in Tomogamy about the ice road that didn't happen last year. Oh, be, oh because of that. Yeah. 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 Dermot, it's been great having you in. Thanks for for, uh, Thanks for sharing with us and continuing your uh you know, your artist <laughs> journey and, yeah, uh, and sharing it with Yeah, I know. It's, it's wonderful. <laughs> Dermot, wonderful. Dermot's amazing Thank adventure. You, Scott. Yeah. Thank you yeah. so much. And Dave. You're listening to the Echo Essentials podcast. I'm Scott Clark. And I'm Dave Dale. Please like, share, and comment. That helps us out. And subscribe to the newsletter, Echo Essentials. I'm Ben, podcast producer here at North Bay Echo, and the Echo Essentials newsletter is a great way to get all of the news and events that are happening in the North Bay area, and of course, all the newest podcast episodes in one neat package. And it's very easy to sign up, and you can get subscribed in a few simple steps. 
So first, you're going to want to head on over to northbayecho.ca. While you're on the home page, you'll see some of the shows that we offer, but we want to keep scrolling down to this panel right here. And you can see there is a box to type in an email address for the Echo Essentials newsletter. So all you have to do is type in your email, make sure to check the box below. And what this will allow us to do is to send you the newsletter to your email. And of course, your info as always is protected by your privacy policy. Hit sign me up and you are good to go. You are officially a subscriber of the Echo Essentials newsletter. If you do wanna check out our past newsletters as well, you can hit the past newsletter option to go right there, or you can just hit the newsletter tab at the top of the page. And now you can see all of the past newsletters that have been published. And there you have it, super easy and simple. And now every Tuesday and Thursday, you will get Echo Essentials right to your inbox.